Hello, my name is Eric Putkinen. Thank you for joining me. Today I'm talking about abiding as the unbound. It's kind of an interesting state per se, um, enlightenment, awakening, liberation. And many traditions have different pointers they use to try to illustrate what it's like. And sometimes in Zen, they'll make reference to having nothing to hold on to. There is having this kind of being or attitude of having nothing to hold on to. And it is a totally free and liberated state, per se. I don't like using the word state, but when you're using words to try to convey things, it's really hard to you know, say anything else, really. Because most people's normal lives aren't that. <laughs> they feel trapped in some way, bound. They have attachments. There's other things going on um, that they don't feel particularly free. And so, in that way, you could say those are two states. But that's how I'm using the word state. Because enlightenment isn't a state. But that which transcends states... It's beyond state, but uh, when you're describe in context of before and after, two states. And so, in this state, per se, you're not holding on to anything. But more specifically, with a deep realization of the truth of non-duality, there's no me to try to hold on to anything. You know, not only is there nothing to hold on to, but there's no me to try to hold on. And so, doubly, there's no holding on going on. And so, it is very much a kind of a free-flowing way of being. And so, for those that are, you know, seeking enlightenment, awakening, liberation, it's sometimes conducive to shake up the binds and attachments we have because they are all self-made we have we're constantly binding or binding ourselves and attaching ourselves and so if you know the end result is to be unbound to hold on to not, to not hold on to anything to not be clinging to not be repelling then you could observe, watch, investigate, and question the instances you've noticed where you're not, where you're not that, where you are clinging, where you are attached, where you are bound in some way. Because if you're able to kind of shake up that structure, it does diminish the me. That's why it's conducive. Because the me, fundamentally, is maintained and strengthened by constant struggle, strain. Not only does this me create the bindings, but it also is struggling against those <laughs> to maintain itself. And so if you let go, if you... You know, when you notice an attachment, a binding in some way, something you're trying to hold on to, cling on to, or repel, then try to see what's really going on. Delve into it more deeply. See from where the clinging or the binding or attachment or the repelling arises. Because if you're able to let it go, there's one less thing not only binding you, but also fueling the me, this illusory me. Now, there's a story at the beginning, kind of a prelude story in the book Illusions by Richard Bach. And it's, I think it's a parable of a kind, but it talks about a little river creature. And him and all of his kind are clinging onto the rocks. 
resisting the, the current. And, you know, they get battered, you know, from time to time. But, you know, there's this security in holding on to the rock. Um, but long story short, one day, one of these little creatures decides to let go. Now, what I find interesting is it's pointed out that initially, after letting go, he's battered and bruised as he's, you know, he bumps into other rocks and stuff. But the currents eventually lift him up a bit. And he's able to just sail along without issue. Now, I like this story a little bit because one of the main reasons why we cling on to things is for security. And we are deeply afraid that if we let go, we could be hurt. But to be unbound means being vulnerable, letting go of that security, but also fully accepting the inevitability you will be hurt because of it. <laughs> and so instead of being afraid, well, if I let go, I could be hurt. It's letting go knowing you're going to be hurt. <laughs> it is having the courage, so to speak, to let go knowing you're going to be hurt, but there's the freedom in it. If you are hurt, you're hurt. But can you allow that to be in order for yourself to be free? And a little, a little crustacean or animal in its shell is never truly free. It's bound within the boundaries of its shell. You know, if you're in full plate armor, it restricts your movement. It's hard to get around. You're not really free. You're lugging this thing around wherever you go. And well, there is a certain amount of security and feeling of safety in this. It is possible to live without the armor. <laughs> oh, but what happens? I could get hurt if I don't have this armor. This actually reminds me of uh, a story a friend of mine told, told me. He was uh, in, in his neighborhood and uh, he saw this guy jogging. And he wasn't jogging very fast. It was a very slow jog. But he's jogging along the, the, along the sidewalk. And he's got knee pads and elbow pads and a bicycle helmet. On, you know, he, he's got all, all these, he's all padded up. And my friend asked him, why are you wearing all this stuff? And the guy very, very seriously responded, I could fall. <laughs> For the fear of falling, he wears helmets and knee pads and, and, you know, elbow pads and all this stuff, even though he's doing a light jog somewhere. People are so f afraid of pain, of being hurt, that they don all this fundamentally unnecessary armor. I mean, if he fell at the speed he was going, what is the worst that could happen? <laughs> I mean, he wasn't an old man. It wasn't like a 90-year-old guy doing a light jog around the block where, you know, the bones might be brittle at that point and any fall could be, uh, you know, a permanent disability at that point. Now, he was a, he was a fairly middle-aged guy. And so as long as your body is able to heal, as long as you're able to recover, what is wrong with potentially taking a fall? Children have no issue with taking a fall. <laughs> they do these mad tricks on bicycles or balance on different things and fall off and, and or skateboards, you know, and it, there's all these different things they do. But at some point, 
is instilled this great fear of being hurt. And we refuse to take any chances to don then we take and don on all this armor. And this is actually on a, on a, on a physical level. The same thing happens on emotional, intellectual levels because of perhaps bad relationships or failed relationships, we don on emotional armor and don't want to reveal ourselves because we could be hurt. <laughs> and so is that really how you want to live? Because I, when I say abiding as the unbound and I suggest letting go and basically freeing yourself from all this, it may initially bring on almost an existential, existential crisis because there's, there's, a, there's a twofold, I could get hurt, but also without all, without all these bounds and bonds and struggle, there's less fueling the me, and so the me will feel diminished, and then there might be this freaking out of, I might disappear. If there, if there isn't this strong feeling of me, what am I? And so, you got to be aware of the, these things. They arise simply because we want to feel the security, and so we pull back, and we cling on to something else. That's what most people do. I, I could get hurt, or what happens to me? And they'll, and, and there'll be this subtle clinging onto anything they can find to rebind themselves to something so they have something to hold on to. And this is a tendency I think is helpful to watch and observe and question within. Because if you can lessen that tendency, then you'll be able to let go of far more. And when you let go of things and say, let go, you don't have to be in control. You don't have to know what's going on. <laughs> You don't have to be all armored up in case something, in case, you know, some, you know, some crap hits the fan. But I mean, it's, if you're able to just let it go, there may be this realization, you know, nothing bad happened. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. I wasn't in control. I wasn't all armored up, but you know, nothing bad happened. I wasn't hurt. Because all this stuff we acquire as we as we grow and due to the damages we have we've we've taken the physical pain the emotional mental hurt we don't want to feel it and so we figure out ways to armor ourselves or attach ourselves or otherwise look for security so we will never feel that again and the unbound to have that to be able to be unbound means not worrying about being hurt again <laughs> it means just <clears throat> being open and allowing things to be allowing things to happen much like the little creature I talked about. Let go of the surface of the rock, and yes, immediately got thrashed against the rocks and bounced off things. The letting go, in that instance, resulted in a fairly quick return of being harmed. But instead of Clinging on to the very next thing, he, instead of clinging on to the very next rock he bumps onto for dear life, for stability again, and to not being hurt, he refused to hold on again. And the current lifts him up, and he's not hurt. 
and he sees things from a totally different point of view and he's free. You know, there's all these little di different teaching stories they have in different traditions and, and or other authors may use. But, you know, the point is you can't shy away. I know that sometimes I've seen on Quora and elsewhere this idea of, well, will enlightenment end pain? And I, I always answer, well, suffering, chronic suffering ceases, but pain will continue to arise. Pain is inevitable. And then I sometimes have people reply back and go, well, if pain doesn't end, what's the point? <laughs> they think they should never, ever have to feel pain again. And I'm like, well, that's unrealistic because if you couldn't feel pain, you wouldn't have the sense of touch. You could never feel the caress of a loved one again. Do you really not want to be able to feel touch ever again? And I think most people would go, no, I want to be able to, I want to, be able to touch. I want to be able to feel. Feeling is a great thing. The sense of touch, you know, is, is I think, undervalued. Because touch is a great thing, but in order to have the capacity to feel the sense of touch, there also has to be the possibility of pain. So that way, if you cut through the, the receptors that can feel, that cutting is so extreme that it results in the feeling of pain. <laughs> the two go together. You can't have one without the other. And so... To ask, well, how can I never feel pain again? Well, it means never feel touch again. So you have to kind of go, you have to accept that, well, if I, if I want to be able to feel, I have to be able to feel pain. Pain is an, is an inevitability. Pain has a function. Pain makes sure I take care of injuries. Because how many lepers or diabetics or others with neurological diseases over the millennia have got a cut, scrape, whatever, didn't notice it because they couldn't feel it. It got infected, festered, turned gangrenous, and eventually had to be amputated or it killed them. That kind of thing happens because you can't feel the sense of touch, because you can't feel pain. Pain has a function. And so we can't try to avoid pain to the degree that we do. We don all this armor and try to block so we don't feel. But it makes us very insensitive, unable to, to feel. Even more so on an emotional level. If you're very much armored up because you've been hurt, and you're armored up so that way you don't think you could be hurt again, you may find that you just don't feel very deeply. <laughs> it's just kind of a void or cold or however everyone you want to talk about it. But the real juice of it, the real juice of feeling, of emotion, you know, means you're not trying to protect yourself from anything negative from arising. Not to say that all these negative feelings will necessarily arise because enlightenment you know, is a cessation of uh, suffering. And suffering includes many of these negative emotions. So when people are talking about self-pity, loneliness, uh, you know, guilt, regret, worry, anxiety, fear, these really do not arise because the understanding is different. In case the understanding is such that you still could be hurt by something is not reason enough to <laughs> try to dull the senses and armor up. That's the point I'm trying to make. Because the potential is there. I mean, at times, there's traditions like 
in Buddhism, they'll say, um, sorrow is a suffering that, cease, that can cease. There should be an end of sorrow, which would be sadness, sorrow, things like that. And by and large, I would say it's true. But I would never try to get so black and white to say all forms of sorrow, sadness, can never arise for one who is enlightened. Because then you, you would you're, you'd be kind of throwing out too much. Because even Ramana Maharshi, when his mother died, shed a few tears. And I think it would be a mistake to point at that and go, oh, he cried, so he was sad, so he wasn't enlightened. I think that would be a mistake. <laughs> and so you... Uh, Basically, you never know what conditioning is still embedded in the body-mind until the right conditions arise. And so, something could arise where any, any emotion could potentially arise. But, usually the understanding you know, if there's a deep, non-dual understanding, if, if, if that is the true understanding, that will tend to have the emotion flow quite quickly away. Because of the, you know, the condition arises, and it's like, oh, there's, there, there's sorrow, there's sadness. You just let it be, you let it go away, but at the same time, the understanding comes in. They're not really going anywhere. They didn't leave. <laughs> and so, that kind of thing can happen. And so I would never point to Ramana and go, he's not enlightened because he shed tears. So I would never go black and white, but I would say, you know, the, the thing is, is opening up the potential, being vulnerable to feeling, allowing them to be, is another way of unbinding or being unbound. And so just, I guess, different ways to think about it. I've kind of talked about it on a physical level, talked about it on, a, on an emotional level, talked about attachments a bit, uh, you know, clinging, grasping, trying to hold on to things. Um, I mean, this could even be identity-wise. You, know, you try to hold on. This is me. Um, you know, I mentioned that our bindings are self-created. So, I mean, these are all kind of pointers to add fodder for further contemplation, <laughs> consideration, and delving into on your part. So, if you've got any questions, comments, Please post below. But until next time, thank you much.